text and just say, is it working? It says one viewer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Dr. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> Thank you now. Uh, Dr. Holman, uh, um, your fruit quotes some local policy, and in particular the core strategy. Is that correct? I believe so. Um, I, I'm sure that your general experience will uh, allow you uh, to uh, agree that in dealing with development plan policy, there are at least two principles that one needs to have in mind. First of all, it's important to read the documents as a whole. Yes? <coughs> I mean, I'm an air quality person, so I wouldn't read the whole document, but I would read the preamble of um, policy. Okay. Oh, well, at least read the policy as a whole. Yes? <laughs> Uh, and uh, in looking at whether or not uh, any particular proposal complies with the development plan, um, and I'll, I'll limit the ambit of the question, you'd at least want to look at the whole of the policy that you were considering conflict with and not just one part of it. Yes? Yes. Uh, to, to take the, the first point, the, the broader point, purpose, um, it would be important, wouldn't it, in looking at the core strategy and looking at the group's objections to further development impacts on air quality for the inspector to be cognizant of these, to the extent to which the council was promoting major development in its now adopted core strategy in areas which would impact in the terms that you would say are unacceptable on air quality. I must admit I haven't looked at all the other developments that they proposed in their core strategy. Uh, we'll do that with a more appropriate witness from our own point of view at a later stage, but I simply make the point that needs to be done. And I noted in your, your truth, you quote particularly uh, policy L5, didn't you? Or L5, 13, 14, I think you quote. Is where, that right? Where, where are you? Sorry, you're putting the card up at your. Yeah. Relevant policy and guidance. Local plan policy, section 2 2 of your group, yep. on page 4. Okay. And um, you quote uh, L5 um, 13 and L5 14. Just picking up the point we noted, sorry, Tom, uh, a point we noted uh, earlier. L513 and L514 uh, uh, are using language which is uh, the type of language we discussed earlier. Development has potential to cause adverse pollution. Yes? yes. Uh, and in L514, uh, um, last two lines, assign such a way to find the impact of nuisance from these sources to acceptable levels appropriate to the proposed use concern. Yep. Uh, and we all perhaps just to note that L515 uh, starts with the word within. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's right, isn't it, uh, Dr. Holman, that uh, that same policy, that not even going outside the policy that you've looked at, policy L5, uh, uh, deals with a range of other matters apart from just those in L5, 13, 14, and 15. That is correct. Could you just help me by telling me what the core document is? I've read the 
and vibration of the source. Proposals for development of closest source of pollution, noise or aura, vibration were required to ensure an acceptable environment for use of the development. With the overarching uh, sentence one, uh, first sentence of paragraph 1418, uh, setting the context. Then 1419, Trafford Air Quality Management Area identifies where air quality will not reach the national health based objective. Trafford and the nine other great Manchester authorities have published their air quality action plan, which sets out how the conurbation will improve air quality. The plan is mainly concerned with tackling transport related emissions and is closely tied to the local transport plan for Great Manchester. Now, th that is precisely the point I put to you earlier, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and we should note that this is a plan adopted in January 2012. Uh, being through an examination process, there is no caveat entered there is there with regard to the ability to achieve the objectives which are being set. That's true. Thank you. <coughs> uh, so, uh, uh, in fact, if you just turn over a page from there, the, the next thing I want to just draw attention to was that outside of the ambit of policy L6, but <coughs> still, of course, within the development plan and material from the inspector's point of view uh, with regard to this application would be a, a, a L6, the, the waste policy, yes? Yes. Uh, which um, you will see um, effectively sets out the parameters for considering uh, <coughs> waste developments. Yes? Yes. And are you able to identify either from here or from any other part of the plan, the point at which the council has said that one of those parameters for waste developments is uh, either that they should not be located within urban areas, or not within or adjacent to AQMAs, or not have any adverse impact on an AQMA. Uh, paragraph L63 says, in determining application for new waste management facilities within the borough, the council has full regard to the environmental social and economic impact of such development, including the scope for securing long-term benefits and improving the environment, etc. Yes. Well, if that's it, I'm content. Thank you very much. Uh, now we need to look just briefly at the Air Quality Directive, uh, not, not literally look at the directive, that's an excitement which uh, we all get too much just after lunch. But um, uh, the Air Quality Directive um, transposed into United Kingdom law, and I don't think it's any part of anything you're saying that it hasn't been properly transposed. It's, it's in yeah, the Air Quality Standards Regulations 2010. Yeah. And uh, your proof of evidence. Paragraph 235 is referring to what the UK government uh, has done. Yes? Uh, it may not make any difference, but I think I do just need to be clear. The submission that the government made to the EU was withdrawn rather than rejected. Withdrawal, yes. Is, I, I, I think, actually, yes, I probably used the wrong word earlier. If you look in my um, appendix, it actually has the yeah, I've read it. notice. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have read it. Uh, and, but it, and it was only, uh, and uh, it may not matter, but, but you twice said this morning rejected. My apologies. It, right. It's been withdrawn by the UK government. And one of the things, that, uh, it was withdrawn on the basis of government consideration of it. One of the things the government didn't say was that our modelling is all wrong uh, and uh, it's not carried out on a proper basis. The withdrawal was not, was not motivated by any lack of conviction as far as the government was concerned with regard to the modelling, was it? You're absolutely right. You would be amazed at the amount of debate amongst the air community about the accuracy of that. Um, model, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to take on board what no. many of us feel that is an inadequate. No, well, I, I have to ask you about right. it, because uh, from Mr. Rich's point of view, he's, he's going to be reporting in relation to a matter which is of uh, some significance, and 
and said it's very important, therefore, to know accurately, one, the government withdrew the submission, it wasn't rejected, two, the government did not uh, withdraw from or cast any doubt over the accuracy of the exercise, uh, which was the airport modelling supporting the submission. Yeah? That is true. Uh, and in relation to that, you refer to the, um, at the end of your paragraph 235. You refer to the modelling undertaken for DEFRA to assess compliance shows the M60 close to breath is one of the worst roads in the Greater Manchester urban area, with concentrations predicted to be greater than 60 micrograms per litre in 2008. And that that's your. Um, Figure yes, it's, it's the, the, the figure in your appendix two, isn't it? No. It's your figures. <coughs> and it's that, that, if I, sorry, if I pulled up, it's that figure that you produced. I didn't produce it, it comes directly from the documents that yeah. the government prepared. But it, in fact, uh, I know it comes directly from the document, but in fact, the figure you produced called your figure one, in the document is part of a larger figure, figure seven, isn't it? I believe so, yes. I, I, I'm sorry, I did believe so because I'm not sure the number. Rebuttal appendices, appendix four. The front sheet is a, a billiard sort of green. Very deferent. I've got figure seven. Yeah. And with, within that document, uh, at page 23, Figure seven, which is 
you've shown has only dated uh, 2008 and then um, said 2010, 15, and 20. Yes? Yes. Now, uh, what Mr. Oakley tells us at 2.36 uh, is that he's reviewed that information, attaches it, and he says that figure 7, about the middle of the paragraph, shows the predicted nitrogen dioxide concentrations on low roads in Greater Manchester in the years given. Um, and it can be seen that the only roads which exceed 40 micrograms per meter cubed by 2015 is the A5061 from Junction 9 of the M60 towards Manchester and the M60 around Junction 17. Figure 9 shows that the introduction of a low emission zone would allow the objective to be achieved on the A5061 but not the M60. Neither of these stretches of road would be significantly affected by the proposal, and so it can be seen that the proposal is not responsible for extending the period in which nitrogen dioxide concentration exceeds air quality objective. Now, as a, as a matter of fact, based on the, uh, the figures produced in the DEFRA documents, what Mr. Oakton has recorded with regard to exceedance or not exceedance is correct, is it not? Uh, it is correct that that's what this document um, shows, that um, things are going to improve. On the other hand, as I just alluded to earlier, because the, um, the lack of improvement in road vehicle emissions, this is quite an optimistic um, modelling exercise. It uses um, the government has a thing called the National Atmospheric Emission Inventory, and within the National Atmospheric Emission Inventory are a lot of emission factors. So they have emission factors for all different sorts of vehicles. So depending on which Euro standard they were built to, and a whole lot of other factors, and they and they estimate how air quality is going to change between now and the future. So this is the results of the study done by King's College, TRL, and, and the University of Leeds that came out. I think in July 2011, that has raised quite a lot of doubt about the way the government has forecast road traffic emissions in the future. <coughs> As I said earlier to you, uh, since two, about, around about 2003, it depends on the site, air quality has not improved. Um, at many locations, it's remained more or less the same. Each site is slightly different, but in general, the consensus is that air quality hasn't improved in terms of nitrogen dioxide concentration in the rate that was previously expected. So these, this modelling here, although official, although done by DEFRA, although committed to the European Commission, is not what many of us who work in the air quality field believe will happen in the future in terms of road traffic concentration. Clearly, Dr. Holman. Uh, it's neither for me or perhaps others to uh, set about um, uh, as well reordering the government's approach. All, all we can say at the moment is that the government's position in a formal document submitted to the EU, which, <coughs> which relates directly to the prospect of infraction proceedings, doesn't it? It does. And I'm uh, proceedings, I'm, I'm not up to date because we've just started. Relating directly to infraction proceedings, uh, and therefore the government knowing that it's going to be subject to examination by all sorts of experts within Europe, contains the predictions which we have indicated uh, and to which Dr. which Mr. Oakman has outlined. I cannot deny what's in this document. Good. Excellent. But I can explain that I don't believe they're right, okay. and I'm not uh, okay. You've got made that point. Thank you. Uh, I understand the, the, the view you've expressed, but it seems then we, we simply need to be clear that the, the only basis upon which the inspector could then conclude uh, that um, uh, uh, the view which Mr. Oakham sets out in paragraph 236 about what's going to happen is wrong is by rejecting the government's uh, prediction. This model is very generic. And I think I, I'd just like to draw attention to the, the, the data that's also in, in, in my appendix, which is in figure two, which is from the 
echoes monitoring station, it's the only sort of long term monitoring data that we can get into within the inquiry. It goes from 1997 to 2011. It's in a bit, you've probably seen it. This is in my um, appendices, figure two of my appendices. There, there seems to be very little trend in the data. Really? Have you done a trend analysis? I have done a trend. I've, I've done a trend analysis. It goes down, doesn't it? Um, Dr. I just trend. think I was going to get there. Right. I said it appears to it appears um, not to change. Um, I have done a trend um, analysis, assuming that it's a linear trend, and it reduces by 1.6 microgram per cubic meter per year over yeah. that period. Um, but if you if you actually it depends on what you take as your starting point. In my evidence, I have on a number of occasions uh, tried to explain that air quality varies significantly from year to year. Um, the local air quality management technical guidance talks about maybe 30% change in annual mean concentration as a result of the weather changing. And we all know the weather changes on a year by year basis. That's our, all our own personal experience. So if you were to take, you know, some of the higher concentrations, say, and if it's a similar trend, and I'm not saying that it is a similar trend, if a similar trend of 1.6 microns cubic meter was applicable to um, Liverpool Road where you've got a maximum concentration of 68, um, it takes a long time to get down to 40. I can't remember the exact amount of years, if it's linear, which it won't be because of the year, year variation. But it depends on where your starting point is. But even in those places where it is improving, if the concentration is currently up extremely high, it's going to be years before it meets the mm -hmm. limit value. That's the answer to my question. Sorry, I've got diverted. Please mm -hmm. repeat your question. <coughs> the only basis upon which uh, the inspector could reject what Mr. Oakley sets out as paragraph 236 of his final <coughs> proof as to what is going to happen is by rejecting the government's projections in their submission to the European Commission. I, th I think uh, uh, you're much more aware of the procedures of the planning than I am, Mr. Kingston, but it seems to me that um, Mr. Richards, as the inspector, can take expert opinion into account while he is doing his um, review of all the evidence, and I'm sure that he will do that. Yeah, I'm absolutely confident he will as well. Uh, but that doesn't alter my question. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, Mr. Richards is perfectly entitled to report to the Secretary of State uh, that, that um, uh, this is not going to happen uh, and should be re rejected. But that would involve rejecting the, uh, the material that was submitted by the government to the European Commission. I don't think Jeff will have any, would be surprised at all <laughs> to hear that I and other experts are not believe it. Well, They're I'm already aware of that. I'm not surprised to hear that you've done it, uh, of course. <laughs> um, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the comments that you made about the uh, the consequences of that highlighted by Mr. Oden are, of course, by 2015, other than those two areas and then the low emission zone. Do, do you know what the opening date is predicted for this? Um, EPUK guidance and the use of judgments. Um, there is no difficulty, at least from Mr. Oden's point of view, in uh, the application of judgment. But perhaps the only thing that needs to be observed is that one needs to consider uh, the extent to which judgment is engaged in circumstances where you have a contribution which is easily uh, characterized as being negligible. Because what, what, well, I would disagree with that if it well, was I'm, I'm sure, sure you would. But, but if it was negligible, <coughs> then you would come to a different conclusion. You would. Thank you. Um, it, as to um, Mr. Oden's judgment and the overall significance here. Um, it's right to say isn't it, that his overall judgment has been supported as to the relevance of uh, the significance of impacts, supported now by
by the Environment Agency in the permit and decision document. Yes, they, they, well, they haven't given the permit. Well, um, in, in the, um, their, their overall view, uh, it, it accords with his, they may have uh, different route, disagree with the chemistry model, but their overall judgment is the same as his. Except, yeah. yes. But likewise, Trafford Borough Council's uh, expert pollution and control team, their overall judgment is the same as Mr. Oakley. Um, I need to check that. Can you just refer me to the little the, the traffic? Uh, well, uh, the other thing you can ask behind the traffic by Mr. Watson. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I have put the same point to Mr. Watson. I have the terms of answer if I'm wrong. Uh, and you, you will know if you've read the report to the committee, and I think you have, that uh, uh, traffic have been advised with regard to air quality, not only do they have a, an expert, but very experienced. Uh, if what I've read is correct, uh, licensing pollution control team. They've been advised by Dr. Mark Brumfield from AEA. Am I sure you know? I do know. And is a competent air quality consultant, isn't he? He's been around a long time. He certainly has. And is competent, isn't he? I have no reason to think he's not competent. Thank you. Uh, 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 likewise. But I would just say, in terms of, um, I would like to see the terms of reference. Um, of what, what question was the answer addressed? I don't know. I've not seen any written evidence from um, Mark Bloomfield that, of his advice to the local authority. Now, it may be that that document is available, and I just haven't seen it, but I haven't seen it. Well, if you, if this is one of those situations, uh, frankly, if you haven't asked, you're unlikely to get, uh, and I can't help you in that, that regard. All, all I can tell you is that what I've read uh, and this is where it's unfortunate that you hadn't seen the uh, February 2011 Court Document 15B and September 2011 Court Document 23 submission, uh, because you would have seen the extent to which uh, that there was nothing in what was coming from licensing and pollution control, particularly with regard to air quality, which was aiming towards uh, an assumption of approval. So. When, when we say that this is a matter of judgment, Mr. Oakton is entitled, isn't he, fairly to say, that his judgment is one which has been supported independently by a series of competent, professional, either bodies or individuals. Yes? Yes. I agree with you that there have been a number of experts in, that have made um, comments to the local authority environment agency and they have um, not always agreed with my point of view, but I would point out that the evidence from the Salford Salford Council, um, the consultant they used, Leslie Goodall, I think her name was. Um, it was a firm called Miller Goodall. <coughs> yes, but her name was Leslie yes. Goodall. Um, and in her evidence, she did make a somewhat fundamental mistake. Well, uh, you, you'll have noticed that I, I, I haven't referred to Miller Goodall, or indeed to Salter, though I might well have done, having regard to the overall conclusions reached. So you needn't trouble with that from my point of view. I've drawn attention to three, thus far in this inquiry, unimpeached source, <laughs> independent sources, and I've done so in order to avoid controversy and lengthening the debate. Um, IPCC control and the setting of limit plans uh, and the inspector and you I know, you know all about the way they're set and the basis upon which the agency therefore considers the permit issue. And it's right to note here, isn't it, uh, Dr. Holton, that the permit and the permit conditions have expressly responded to the characteristics of the location uh, for this proposal. They, they have in terms of the fact that the restriction on the height of the stack means that the width of the limits will not have been reduced in this Well, we, we... I think my answer is yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, this place. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, in that case, I, I didn't uh, take that uh, um, uh, any, any further. Now, um, 
uh, add to uh, uncertainty, um, and uncertainty in the modeling exercise, it, it, it's absolutely fundamental, isn't it, to, to proceed on the basis of any modeling exercise involves degrees of uncertainty. Yeah. Yes? And uh, without being unkind, not being averse to models a lot, at least with computers myself, uh, if you put rubbish in, you'll get rubbish out. Okay. Yeah. So you need, you need to be careful with what you do, and even if you are very careful, you need to respond to the uncertainties of modeling exercise in assessing or forming a judgment on the results which emerge. Yes, but isn't that precisely why the environment agencies, in their approach uh, to setting uh, uh, levels as to what is significant or not, uh, set the significance factors at levels which give what they describe as a substantial margin of safety? Yes, this is Core Argument 67B. Would you like to refer to the page? Yes, if you go to page 26. It's a perfect decision document. So. <laughs> I think I'm right in saying, Dr. Holman, you, you, you have, you've had this document to be able to go through it. Yeah. Um, so I'm not asking you about something you haven't um, No, seen. but I'd just like to sort of see which yes, sure. section you're referring to. Well, the section I'm referring to is under a, a main heading of assessment methodology, a subheading of application of environment agency H1 guidance, and a further unnumbered subheading of screen out insignificant emissions. Yes? yes? Sorry, I'm looking for the I'm sorry. Uh, so page 26 is where it started. Uh, um, um, we have looked at this already uh, in the inquiry, uh, Dr. Coleman, but uh, I wasn't supposed to go right through it. But, but if we look at um, uh, on going on to page 27, what the agency says about the insignificance criteria, they tell us, don't they, that the 1% and 10% threshold uh, is either 100 or 1 tenth of the standard and provides a substantial safety margin to protect health and the environment. Yes? That's what it says. Yeah. And <laughs> that well, it should have said yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, clearly, uh, all of that needs to be taken into account when one's looking at the output of any modelling exercise which is engaging with the question of insignificance or not. Yes? I think one would take that into account, which is why the issue of air quality management also uses the 1%, and hence the EPUK guys also use the 1%. Yes, well, I, 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 I am aware of uh, that. Um, Reasonable to contend myself with the bits that we've looked at already. So, thank you uh, for that. And um, it, it's right, and I don't know again whether you, you haven't seen them, um, but it's right, isn't it, that the additional information which the appellants were required to submit uh, as a result of questions by the council dealt with the question uh, of. Uh, whether the modelling was conservative or not, and the opponents were required to justify the modelling assumptions in order to satisfy the council and the council consultants that a robust approach had been adopted. That's true, but I got a little bit confused when I read some of the evidence. Um, there seems to be a little bit of contradiction in one or two places, um, particularly on um, I think there were two assumptions that I wasn't quite sure about. It is standard practice to normally assume 100% operating hours of the plant as a conservative estimate. And in fact, in one of the submissions, I can't 
can't remember which one it is, it is, all, it is mentioned in a discussion about model uncertainty that 100% of working hours have been used. And certainly the Environment Agency in this document has taken the results of 100% of um, you're looking at me confused, Mr. Well, Richard. I'm just asking if um, there anything different. Um, well, I don't know whether they did 90% or 100 No, that's not true. The results that are presented, first of all, in the environment statement use 100%. And then later on, I think in the addendum, they then talk about the 90%. Um, so that, that's one issue, is that they have not been on the side of caution in that respect. Okay. Well, my understanding is that it was these observations that have been presented. If I'm wrong in that, in some of the documents, we'll deal with it through the work that's right. So, there is some point. So, that's, that's, that's one issue. The other, the other issue that um, the Environment Agency did not accept um, was the use of the ADMS chemistry. And yet, the evidence we've got continues to use that chemistry. If I may say so, I don't think that's quite... quite right. That's my baby. I'm very upset. Can you believe it? Anybody listening to an exchange on air quality? It's a very adult way, we're all going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think we're going to have to move on. Thank you very much. Sarah, we'll deal with that through the strength and explain to you what the, the 19 hours is just now. But uh, um, the, the chemistry module is absolutely clear that the agency said we, we're going to reject these chemistry modules. Again, we, we did cover this yeah. in some depth yesterday with Mr. Watson, so I think I understand what the position is. Fine. Well, well so in that case, case, I'm I not going to go over it. I just wanted to add. No, I think the inspector is happy that um, um, uh, he has uh, heard nothing. I, I'm certainly have heard enough of it. Um, um, My PhD subject was on the reactions of concern, so of course I'd like to talk about it. Yeah. I'm joking, I'm joking. Just, 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 before, uh, just before we leave the, um, the Vermont document, uh, decision document on this uh, point, uh, go to page 42, would you please? Evaluated, 
including uh, having regard to uh, in the second bullet point under 5262 uh, taking into account Liverpool Road. Uh, and it, it's clear therefore that the agency have themselves undertaken an independent assessment of what's appropriate with regard to nitrogen dioxide background. Yes, but I was somewhat surprised that if you look earlier on in terms of the consultation, that it wasn't their own people who brought their attention to it. And, and on page nine, on the bottom of the last paragraph on page nine, it says, more specifically, we've updated some of the information presented in section five of this document to incorporate our view, review of background air monitoring data used in our assessment of air quality. This was undertaken as part of our consultation on the draft decision due to concerns that were raised at our public dropping event on the 12th of June 2012. I'm just slightly surprised that it had to be the public who brought their attention to it and that they weren't aware of it themselves. No, I don't think that's a fair way of reading the paragraph. Uh, with respect. The agency are saying no more, are they? So the, a, a deal of concern was raised at the public drop in effect. And as a result of the deal of concern being raised, they've gone back to look at it and reevaluate it. That's a perfectly proper response to a public consultation, isn't it? Well, I think you can read it in different ways. I've obviously interpreted it in a different way to you. Oh, well. But it did seem that the um BCAG did, have, did make a number of representations to the Environment Agency, and as a consequence, they seem to have taken it on board. I think, and the reason why I think that could have happened is that the Environment Agency is concerned with processes, and they're not concerned with traffic emissions. Yeah. And so they have less knowledge and understanding of the traffic well, issues. But the, the, the tra traffic emissions here have been screened out. Oh, sorry, traffic. sorry, not, not, not the impact of the traffic generated by the proposed development. Because I agree with uh, Mr. Ogden in that respect. I don't, do not believe that the development traffic impacts will be significant. Thank you. So uh, I don't believe that's an issue. What, when I'm talking about traffic, I'm talking about the, the, the current air quality in the area, which is determined largely by local traffic. Well, it is. And, but the agency's decision document makes it absolutely clear they've taken into account the HUMA, doesn't it? Oh, yes, they have taken and the AQMA is driven entirely by traffic issues, isn't it? Well, it's not entirely, but mainly, yes. Yeah. Dominated by. Absolutely, I'd say that's in my own evidence. Thank you. Well, I went through the extent to which the AQMA was taken on board in the decision document yesterday, and I won't repeat it. Uh, in your proof of evidence, please, uh, paragraph uh, 4, 425. Oh, there is just one thing about, uh, I referred to Liverpool Road, and you said in your evidence that Liverpool Road was not referred to in the environmental statement. Um, it wasn't referred to in the text, it was referred to in the table. I would expect that when you're discussing all the data, if you look at the other data presented, there's a little bit of description, a text of it, but there wasn't in the ES, but it's true, it's in the table. It's in mentioned. the text, in the paragraph 12108. It does not call Liverpool Road. So in the ES? Yes. In the uh, 12 paragraph 12.108. It does not call Liverpool Road. Okay, yes, you'll find it, it, it is mentioned. It's not mentioned where I'd expect it to be mentioned, and that's probably why I did But that's, you know, my, my problem, not your problem. It, it's just called um, the Southern AQMA Diffusion Tube. Yes. I'm not answering this. The Salford AQMA Diffusion Tube. And that's the same as Liverpool Road. That's Liverpool Road, yeah. it is, yes. It's page 267. It's 287, you know, we've got uh, we've got conflicting numbers, but 287. Yes, 287. Really? 12108. 287. Uh, we think it's 267. The inspector has 287. I think it's 267, or mine. <laughs> 
same paragraph. It's the same paragraph. Yeah, it's the same paragraph. Yeah, but yeah, it's the same paragraph. <laughs> right. Um, I'm sorry, that's a slight like, distraction from those points that, that I want to go to, but uh, this can be cleaned up there. Um, your proof at paragraph 4.2.5 on page 13. You, you tell us here that data from the Department of Transport database shows that the annual average traffic on the relevant section of the M60 is just over 100,000 vehicles, while that on the M602 is about 35 percent less. However, given the distance of the Eccles monitoring station from the motorway, the contribution of this traffic to the measured air quality will be small. To illustrate the declining concentration of distance from road, Pension Center provides a graph from the highways agency, the MRB. Yes? Yep. Uh, uh, Eccles, the, the distance of the monitoring station from the motorway is about 140 meters. I think it's 190. Um, no, it's Eccles. Tindall Street, it's 190. Hang on, let me just check. Sorry, uh, sorry, figure four. Sorry, I think it's four. Sorry, I have a focus. I think we're figure. Right, well, it depends on where you actually this this figure probably possibly. Um, sorry, 194 meters to Tyndale Street. 194 to Tyndale Street. Yes. And now, now have a look at your figure five. And 140 meters from Eccles to to the M. Yeah. Uh, right. well, I hope that's what I hope to I mean, these, these things actually measured, you know, where do you measure them from and to? Yeah. So, you know, I'll take off a few meters um, either way. I mean, this is, I think, this to the center of the motorway. It could be done to the curb, but... No, I, I'm not concerned with that. I'm okay. perfectly content to, to uh, take the figures on the basis that they, the measurement has to be from A point and there may be some variation that basis, but 140 meters for the Eccles monitoring station, uh, and you say uh, in relation to that, uh, given the distance from the motorway, the contribution of this traffic uh, to the measured air quality will be small. Yes? Well, that's so, small, yes. yes. Well, we don't disagree. I, I just wondered whether you were thinking about the wheel. I'm wondering, listening to you, I should be a bit more circumstantial with the word wheel. Maybe you should say many. Uh, all I can say, Dr. Holman, is that you read it. I know, so, I know. Uh, but uh, 45, um, say it, uh, 46, uh, 45, it, 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 that applies to uh, to uh, the Eccles monitoring station. The same must apply to Tintle Street at 194 meters, must it? Yeah. And uh, we can see uh, how things uh, progress with the, that, that is your diagram, your appendix to that, yes, uh, which uh, uh, as the furthest distance, 200, and clearly once we're at Tyndall Street, we're in that sort of territory, yeah? Um, your proof of paragraph 4 to 7, you say the ES presented data for source and council Fusion tube, tube roadside site at 673 Liverpool Road. I understand that the only diffusion tube in the relevant part of the A2NA. Annual mean concentration of this site was in the range of 58 to 68 micrograms per meter cube between 2005 and 9. No comment is made in the uh, ES about these concentrations. Um, have you seen Mr. Oates' proof of evidence uh, on that? <coughs> Paragraph 2.3.8. So, as it's proved, it's page 8, paragraph 
You understand what it's saying yeah. and how it's responding to the well, it responds a bit if you hadn't seen it, but to the point you're making. And, and in, I, I don't know if you yet know that there was a, a, a further um, a response in Call Document 15B, that's the February 2011 submission, which um, you hadn't seen when you wrote your own.
to assess the level of significance of the impacts of those residential areas within the appellant's 0.4 microgram meat cube contour will give a negligible, minor, moderate, or substantial adverse impact depending on the background concentration. You then at 522 go on to Liverpool Road and you describe it uh, there, uh, the impact as a small adverse impact. Uh, at 523, you say it's likely there are a large number of other properties where the impact would also be a small adverse impact. Uh, and then uh, at 526, uh, we end up with a substantial adverse impact. Now, uh, the reference to small at 522 and 523 doesn't seem to be using the language of the IAQM criteria to set out 521. Have I misunderstood? Um, maybe I could refer you to my appendices to the appendices. Yeah. Yes. Change. Yep, yep, got that. Yep. Annual mean, it says increase of um, less than 10%. So 10% of the objective is 4. So anything above a 4 microgram cubic meter would be described as. Sorry, anything above? 4 microgram cubic meter, i.e. 10% of the 40, yep. would be described as a large magnitude of change. If it's less than 1%, which is the imperceptible, that means it's less than 0.4 microgram. Small is 0.4 to 2, medium is 2 to 4. So, so, so when, when I talk about, um, so when it says in 5 to 1, I see, I do notice that it shouldn't be negligible, it should be imperceptible. So is that. Uh, the, the reason I'm having difficulty with this is that I, I, I've read this document. I can't say gripped by excitement while doing so, but, but uh, I have read it. And I, I noted that the <coughs> table one, the heading um, with the, the, um, the adjective is headed magnitude of change. Yes. 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 Um, Actually, um, maybe if we look at. Well, no, the no, 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 I don't know if I'm going to say it. Sorry. Uh, uh, if you keep skipping about with it, now we need to be clear. This is a magnitude of change, not a significant assessment. Sorry, but this is the first step in determining the significance. <coughs> there are two steps. One is determining the magnitude of change, and the second step is to understand what the sensitivity of the area is. Okay, well let's be clear about the question I've asked you. Based uh, on your section 5.2, which, which was that you started off uh, referring to the IAQF criteria <coughs> of negligible, minor, moderate, or substantial adverse. You then characterize the, in two paragraphs small adverse, but end up at the end of the section saying there'll be a substantial adverse. Uh, sorry, I was, what I was going to do was go through the, how the significance criteria is determined to right. help inform you, so hopefully you can then understand the written. Okay, well, I've, I've so far got that you've got magnitude of change described in the table, which is relatively easy to follow. Yes. And table two, you look at to see increase with the scheme, but there's no decrease, so it's increased. So you look at the whether it's above the objective, just below the objective, um, below the objective, or well below the objective. So that is the current air quality in the area affected. So if it's above one percent criteria, and it is above the objective, then the matrix should suggest that slight adverse impact for that individual receptor. Right. We should note though, shouldn't we, about table two, what's at the top of page four, that table two should not be used as a generic significance matrix that could be used to assess the overall significance of a 
development project in one set, and the IAQM does not endorse its use for that purpose. Absolutely. Very important. That's very important. Yeah. And then it goes on on the next page, which is basically says something very similar. The IAQM does not support, so this is on page five, above the box. The, IQ, uh, the IAQM does not support the adoption of a single method to determine the overall significance of air quality effects due to development. However, when an overall significance description is required, then it should be based on professional judgment, taking into account the factors in box one relevant to the assessment. And one of those factors in the box is the extent to which the objective or limit value is exceeded. So in my view, because there are a number of properties where the EU limit value is exceeded by probably, what we don't really know, a very significant amount, that overall, I would say that there's a, there's a substantial adverse impact of this development on air quality. Right. Uh, and where is the answer to my question about the use of an expression small effort? That so that, that, is what, that is for an, for an individual. All right, so here we said slight in this case. I probably use the UK says small. I probably used as a terminology that was used in the UK. Small and slight interchange. Yes, yeah. in this context. In this context. That, that just let me be clear. Small and slight are interchangeable. So if we, if we, sorry, just to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to jump around, but I'm, I think it's going to be helpful. If, 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 in, in the ES, the term small was used, not the term slight. Right. Uh, sorry, that's not true. Be... Sorry, I'm wrong. I, it does say slight. Sorry. It's, it's a small magnitude. The magnitude is small, and the impact, significance of the impact is slight. Yes. Well, that's the correct way. Well, the ES does is correct in that respect. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. Yes? 
she has that in common. I do. Uh, and looking at the, the box above the ADMS, uh, this, this version modeling on page 167. Now, if I give your views, she commits to register to the contents of that document at that point. Do you mean both the fitting in italics or? Yes, I did. It's specifically fitting in italics. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll read it out for, 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 the, for the public, I think. Um, where a new installation could only make a minor contribution to a breach, it would normally be more desirable for regulators and local authorities where relevant to consider controls on other major sources of pollution rather than imposing excessive costs or refusing a permit. And I think the point here is that the major source of pollution in the area, as we've heard, is traffic, and that it is it has proved extremely difficult to control traffic pollution. Um, I've already discussed this. I've sort of alluded to the reasons why, um, but traffic pollution in general is not improving. Um, I've also alluded to the fact that I don't believe that the air quality action plan will be very effective. They've not been effective elsewhere. The government has commissioned research trying to understand why they're not effective. Um, they don't have, local authorities don't have power to control uh, emissions on highway agency controlled roads, so they have no power other than to influence to control emissions on the motorways. And therefore, I don't believe that there is much that can be done to control the major source of pollution in the area. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. Um, can I just ask a question I put to Mr. Watson, and, um, but I don't think you were here. But in, in, uh, certainly in opening, it's trying to interpret the difference between the DCMG and the council position. And the question I put to Mr. Watson was that he, he's, he's been dealing with the uh, issue on the basis of perception of risk to health rather than actual identified risk to health. Is that your position as well? Uh, my position is that in terms of the public, they know that the EU limit value has been exceeded. They know that the EU limit value has been set in terms of human health. So there is a very understandable reason as to why they would see there is risk to health. I was talking to you rather than addressing um, the World, World Health Organization advised the European Commission on health impacts of air quality for their <coughs> review of air quality standards. Um, <coughs> the WHO has reviewed the 45,000 cubic meter annual mean objective for NO2, and they could see no reason to change that 40 based on the health evidence. Um, to a certain extent, or to some extent, because they felt that it's impossible to measure, monitor, and directly control all air pollutants from combustion sources, and therefore keeping the natural dioxide concentration at 40 micrograms per cubic meter gives it a degree of protection for other pollutants as well that come from the same sources. And, and what's your perception of the degree of protection that that, that level gives? Well, I think the 40, as I said, at 40 micrograms per cubic meter, I don't think the vast majority of healthy people will be adversely affected, but we are talking about some parts of this area being significantly above that level from the evidence that we have.
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your evidence and uh, for coming up today. <laughs> and I think at that point we'll take a break. Yeah, we'll take a break uh, for 15 minutes. And, uh, I think it's me, Mrs. Kitty Watts, is that correct, Mrs. Kennington? That, that's right, sir. Okay. Right, thank you.
Done that before, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Joey. 
week, so is the grandparents left holding the baby. <laughs> Tomorrow. He's speaking tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I spoke with his wife, Anki, yesterday. And I think because she was here listening to what was going on, she was agreeing with um, yeah. Hans. But he would be worth talking to. Because have you read his statement? Have you seen the copy of it? Okay, I haven't brought it with me here, but I've got it at home. Essentially, he's saying from his perspective what I'm saying. Right. Well, it never works. The, the thing is, at the moment, he's not perspective. He is being dismissed. But this is the most important point. And it's not perception, it's an understanding issue. I understand. I don't understand because I'm here in the time. I'm not saying, you're the same, Claire's been the same, and now I'm not saying. So 
So there's been consistency in respect to one issue helping out. Now, the thing is, I honestly don't know what will happen to Richard's talks to the people. And this is the problem. This is the problem. What what we have is okay. That's half full. Is it half empty or half full? And it's a a matter of perception. What you're doing is you're adding ammunition to the point being made and to justify the point. And one of the assertions that's not been made about the objectives is that they're nimbus. The point that is being made by the students is it's already done, it's don't make it worse. And I know why it's getting worse, not just in Britain, but elsewhere. Because we're overloading the atmosphere, it's no longer able to dilute. And this is why the climate change global warming but the importance of the issue is building up CO2. The oceans are getting more acidic because of the CO2. And we're going to be burning... Can we review it a bit, please? This is what... Uh, um, <coughs> come to we're going to be... You'd like to come forward to the table. We can't grow <coughs> fast enough to meet demand. And this is where we get the politics. Is the table empty before you, or do you have documents? I can't see. I think it's very uh, And is that document your summary of your proof of evidence? In which case, I'm simply going to invite you to read it.
clear the visual effect and will have a detrimental impact on the community space and lead concerns to grow ears. As more people realise the size of the farm. In conversations with friends and other residents in the local area, many have expressed to me that they feel because of moving out of the area. There are widespread concerns about the size of the building and the public morale would be fatally damaged if the issue was granted. Traffic has some of the top, sorry, traffic has some of the country's top performing schools. I feel as an educator and parent that over time the area will be less attractive to parents and consequently impact the local school. It's learning that part of our local community is within an air quality management area and we allowed to discover that six schools fall within this air quality management area. Surely the primary concern should be to reduce pollution in the area and not to allow more pollution sorry, more pollution to be introduced as down the area. Several parents have expressed their concerns about the possible health effects their children may suffer, and those who have children who already suffer from asthma are concerned about the additional health effects. On a daily basis, I see children in society and educators to become more active to take responsibility for their health who already have health issues, the most common being asthma. Such children are engaged in living weight in different types of exercises, and some using inhalers to assist them in completing their exercise. It saddens me to think that developers are safe in the field that this is an industrial area and it's okay to release pollutants into the local community and beyond. Residents are scared that the pollution from the plant will affect those in the local community that already have health issues. Further concerns are that residents who do not presently suffer from health problems may also be at risk and future generations to come. To my knowledge, there are no other plants in England that will be operating like proposed plants, so near to an air quality management area in such a densely populated area with a vast amount of schools, schools, sporting facilities, etc., which should show us in life. Other plants have poorly chimney, which allow pollutants to be disturbed over a wider area. If permission was granted, not only would the chimney discharge pollutants, it's high, sorry, it's high would result in the pollution not being disposed as effectively as a smaller chimney would. This again is a major concern that friends and neighbours and parents have raised to me in conversation. People are outraged that residents' safety and health will be compromised if the application is successful due to the city airport. The reason for the shorter chimney is that it would have an impact on the airport. This further adds to my concerns about health, as, though, as even though models have been used, if there is no similar data to compare, are we going to be the guinea pigs and subject the emissions for the next 25 years? I have only mentioned a small area around the proposed site, as the emissions will be dispersed over a much wider area. I think it's important to consider the effects on the wider area. I have three children, all in school age, and I am concerned as within the area I have mentioned. There are several parks, green areas, sporting clubs, athletic clubs where thousands of people enjoy sport and leisure activities daily. Some of every day is walking a dog. My eldest daughter, who has asthma, enjoys about four hours of football a week. This does not include her sporting school and her other activities which she enjoys. I cannot be reassured that she could continue to enjoy her football locally and maintain the level of health that she is currently experiencing. Through a healthy lifestyle and diet, we have managed her asthma. She has never had an asthma attack and never been admitted to hospital. Even though she has asthma, it could not prevent her from taking part in sport or is attributed to her having periods of time at school. I have friends 
whose children are not, are not as fortunate as my daughter. Their children have to choose which sports they can play and cannot engage in. Some have children who have been admitted to local hospitals with lack of telly with asthma related issues. On weekend mornings, I watch my children play football and it deeply saddens me to see the number of children who rely on their inhalers. On the sideline, over the last two years, conversations have arisen to the impact on our, on our children's health if threats were to be built. People are generally concerned about the health of their family and the community as a whole. During the summer, week, weekday evenings, Lee Field and Clixton Field for the football team to practice in. During the winter months, many teams still train outdoors. Few teams, especially the youth teams, cannot afford to train indoors. At weekends, the field and youth throughout the year cease to play. Over 200 players gaining considerable enjoyment from just those two fields. The fields I have mentioned are used by the team that my children play for, as this is only a snapshot. The parks are attractive and have different facilities. Play areas, tennis courts, basketball courts, ponds, skate parks. The parks are always busy at weekends and during the school holidays. Since living in the area, the smells from the sewage works have improved slightly. People don't want other smells or pollution added to the mix. I and local residents do not want the smell of the water burning and the sound of increased traffic from the plants destroying our local environment. I conclude that I and many local residents feel that David Hughes is an unsuitable residential area in which to build rest. The plan will have an impact on every member of the local community. It will have a significant visual impact on our area and finally and most importantly it could have serious unwanted health implications not only for local residents but for residents who live, work and exercise in areas several kilometres downwind of the proposed location. I believe that the highest level of pollution is not being going to do, but is enabling community in Salford. This means that even though the residents of Salford may not suffer the visual and noise impact, they will, they will receive unwanted increases in their levels of pollution and the impact on health that are associated with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Keith, do you Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Have you got your photograph in I front of you? Could somebody provide a copy, please? Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Um, I don't think I do, thanks. It's all um, 
Sorry, sorry. But do you have any breakdown? No, I don't Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much. Now, Mr. Cliff, I, I think we, we just revert to the... Mr. Cliff, okay, thank you very much. If you could just give me uh, a moment to change documents and Mr. Cliff can come take his seat. So, you'll see that... We might see a moment, but Mr. Cliff's proof is... is extremely short, within the word limit um, set out at the pre-inquiry meeting um, for those all to be read alone rather than a summary. Mr. Kingston, we met in Derby. Good afternoon, Mr. <laughs> Fraser, Mr. Cunnington, and everybody else. <laughs> now, Mr. Cliff, do you have in front of you your proof of evidence? I have a copy of my proof of evidence. It's very brief. Um, I've had a lot of help with it from two ladies who uh, include my wife, and uh, she is a retired planner from Greater Manchester Council, so um, she knows how to tell me to turn a diatribe into something brief. <laughs> Could I make the comment before I start that I'm partially cited, so some of the text where it's small, I'm going to have to read it rather close. Um, I'm a, actually a diabetic, I have retinopathy, and that's why if anyone's worried about me using an eyeglass to watch them, it's because I can't see them to recognise faces. So, uh, Mr. Cliff, nobody's going to rush you. To thank to you very much. Take your time. Um, and you start the assistance you need uh, and read away. Um, that, that's very kind of you, Mr. Cunnington. I'm going to start with the introduction. My name is Graham Cliff of 10 Raven Road, Timperley, WA15. 68B. I'm a retired University of Manchester academic. I have been an aerosol nanoanalyst since October 1973. Now I think it's important that when I wrote this, I expected the inspector to be Mrs. Elizabeth Hill, and when I told her who and what I was, I said to her that I would I'm an honorary research fellow at the School of Earth, Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences. Now, she said that sounded very grand. It is. It's what used to be the old George Department. Right. <coughs> okay. I've Sorry. I, I do apologize. As a senior experimental officer, I developed the technique of analytical electron microscopy now used internationally to analyse materials to atom dimensions. I've analysed particles in the air for nearly 40 years in the analytical electron microscope. I'm providing this proof of evidence to voice my objection to the proposed BREP plant from my expertise with nanoparticles. Given my experience, research and findings expressed today, I consider that the proposed siting of the plant is wholly inappropriate, sited so close to such a large residential area. Two. Hazard to human health. 2-1. My principal objection to the proposed BREP is based on the emerging hazards to health that ultrafine particles, UFBs, and nanoparticles, NPs, can cause, 
And I emphasize, I'm going to emphasize by just briefly describing emerging um, the latest paper I got sent yesterday. It's that new. There are serious concerns that surround the impact of waste incineration on human health. My fear is that unregulated aerosol particles particles, particulates, I can't read it, hold it closer, smaller than PM 2.5 are now so serious a threat to public health that their regulation exclusion will lead to unforeseen harm being created by biomass incineration emissions regulated to only PM 2.5. The smaller particles are now being implicated in increases in respiratory diseases, cardiovascular conditions, autoimmune response failure, and even in dementia. To this list we can add ischemic stroke, asthma, and perhaps even undiagnosed silicosis from wood combustion phytoliths emitted in the inadequately regulated fly ash. These phytoliths contribute to the bottom ash quartz, felspar and crystallite to be found in that ash. Quartz, aka silica, is a type 1 carcinogen according to the World Health Organization. I should have added there, everyone I hope has heard of silicosis. Illnesses including infant mortality, heart attacks, stroke, depression, COPD, immune system disorders and cancers which are associated with the PAHs, heavy metals, dioxins, furans that are released with the particulates in the biomass incineration process. I refer to the research article studies contained in Appendix 1 of this proof of evidence, which demonstrate the effects on human health. I also refer specifically to the copy of my letter within Appendix 2, which was published in Microscopy Today, May 2011, titled Nanoparticles and Public Health, paragraph 2.2. The proposed Bonn Renewable Energy Plant, BREP, would be a biomass incinerator. Biomass incineration creates particulates which include Uf UFPs and NPs. Such particulates are known to influence the above diseases by various processes including DNA and mitochondria modification. Paragraph 2.3. The particulates are supposed to be filtered to standards introduced in June of 2010. This requires they are filtered to PM 2.5 instead of PM 10. But biomass incineration creates particulates at and below the PM 1 level the smallest particles which are known to be the most hazardous to health. Experts admit that they, it is impossible to remove all of them with the current UK filter systems in place. Therefore, the smallest particles will escape into the local area and affect all of Greater Manchester. The UK Environment Agency recently wrote that 55, sorry, 35% of PM 2.5s and 90% of PM 1s get through the current UK bag filters, hence the health damage. This was reported in Air Quality, a follow-up report by Dr Dick Van Steenis in Parliament session 2010-2012, the 19th of May 2011, and there is an, in my statement a URL, a uniform resource locator um, from which you can read that on the internet. It's rather lengthy. I'm no longer active 
um, in academia, and I cannot comment further. However, if Parliament accepts a statement that bank filters capture to levels well below 8, 100%, then I too will accept a figure accepted by Parliament until it proves to be wrong. I do know that nuclear pore and millipore filters can capture to nanometer dimensions, but these would hardly be practical, and I should have added the caveat that is what we use for air filtration in asbestos analysis, so we can see very small. Paragraph 2.4. Incineration is being banned in Belgium and there are almost no new plants being proposed in many other countries, for example France and the USA. This is because of recognised problems and health risks that are emerging associated with these plants. Plasma arc incineration is now internationally recognised as a cleaner technology than the biomass proposal and without the associated health risks. However, this is not a part of the BREP planning application, according to Stephen Offen, Offen Fichter Limited, consultants to Peel Energy, and Stephen told me that the 10th of December 2010. For all these reasons, I do not consider it is safe to cite the proposed BREP the BREP plant so close to such a residential community which is already an area of poor air quality being designated as a specific AQMA, Air Quality Management Area. Paragraph 2.5. If the biomass incinerator is allowed in Trafford, the air pollution radius of the affected area will be large enough to connect with the radius of, other, uh, of areas affected by other incinerators. Those current and about to be built, for example, the INS plant. There will be interaction of pollutants creating secondary particles adding to health effects. The model used to illustrate the radius of dispersion of pollutants from the smokestack is apparently a standard Gaussian model. While this can cope with particles larger than PM10, it is being questioned with respect to particles on the nanometer scale. I am currently in discussions about this issue with a researcher at Sussex University. A student with whom I worked on Manchester air pollution remarked in her MSc thesis in 1981 that the smallest particles which we were founding, which, which we could see, would have long-range environmental impact. That remains true today. Small lead particles from China can be found in California, having travelled in the jet stream across the Pacific Ocean. And that's a personal communication from Dr. Jennifer Ewing at Berkeley Laboratory, California, USA. Paragraph 3, the precautionary approach. 3.1, I have particular expertise in the identification of small asbestos fibres in the air. My colleagues and I published our research techniques in the Journal of Microscopy in 1976 with the title The Identification of Asbestos. We could analyse infinitesimally small asbestos particles to 50 nanometers. I think that we should draw on our knowledge and experience of what happened with asbestos fibres and smoke inhalation, and for this reason I request that a precautionary approach is adopted when considering the proposal to build the BREP plant so close to human residences. 
3.1 I believe that we do need to learn the lessons from history. I refer in particular to an article which I have previously written which is contained within Appendix 2 of the enclosed statement What you can't see can still hurt you. Nanoparticles and Public Health Part 2 uh, I submitted that just for your information to Nature. Nature have asked me to do a peer-reviewed paper and not an opinion piece. So I'm in the process of developing that. Paragraph 3.3 I further believe that the burning of domestic and commercial waste as proposed by Peel Energy under the WID imperative will add to the unregulated burden of harmful nanoparticles already created by industry and transport today. Paragraph 4. Conclusion. In conclusion, I do not believe it is appropriate to cite the proposed plant in the proposed location so close to a largely populated area. I and the local residents do not want to breathe the unregulated sub-PM2.5 particles of fly ash that I expect to be emitted from the smokestack of the BREP for the next 25 years should it be built. And there I conclude. Thank you very much. Nice to see you again, Mr. Christie. Yes, I... Let me put my glasses on, so at least I stand a chance of recognising <laughs> um, your, your laughter. <laughs> um, Mr. Cliff, um, you, you um, have referred in your paper at the top of page 3 to Dr. Dick Van Steenis. Yes. Um, uh, perhaps more regularly than you and I, Dr. Van Steenis makes his appearance, doesn't he? Uh, at any inquiry of this kind? Um, it's not as good as Dennis Ridley. <laughs> but if, if we want to see Dr. Van Sienis' approach, uh, going to your Appendix 3, um, and uh, I, I found the print on this challenging, so it may well be rather more difficult from your point of view. Let me get the appendix. Bear with me. Appendix 3, Air Quality A Follow-Up Report. That's right. And this is uh, written evidence submitted by Dr. Van Sienis, uh to Parliament, yes? It, it is. Um, do we need to explain to the public when it was written? I'm By all means, do so if you'd like to. It's not important from my point of view. No, oh, okay, well, I will follow. It was submitted in the session you've told us about, and you can see that. But um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Van Tiedis introduces his uh, position in paragraph one. But then in paragraph two, he tells us, doesn't he, that Despite the ECPM 2.5 Urban Air Quality Directive put into UK law in mid-2010, DEFRA has just installed some 30 TEQM machines, mostly in the London uh, area of the nine, nine incinerators, and fiddled them down to falsely and fraudulently read a constant reading of 50 micrograms per meter cube, when readings after installation before fiddling averaged about 50 micrograms per meter cube in Hillington. This follows DEFRA's fiddling of the nationwide CM10 TEON machines to read a constant 26 micrograms per meter cube since around the time John Prescott downgraded the Environment Protection Act in 2000 to anything will do. The Environment Agency grants in 2010 confirmed this fact. It is impossible to sort anything without looking at health data and getting honest readings of PM 2.5. So it's clear, isn't it, that Dr. Van Tienis proceeds on the basis 
the Defra and perhaps others are involved in, among other things, fiddling the machinery and the readings, uh, and fraudulently then uh, producing material, as he puts it. That's his assertion. I can't agree with it, but um, I'm afraid that is Dick Van Sleedis, the man. I, I note you drawing my attention to that statement, and I repeat that his assertion that they're falsely fiddling the numbers um, causes me concern because in 2007 I have a document from DEFRA and I'm a serial correspondent with DEFRA um, and I'm told Eric Pickles has taken note of that fact and the causes for concern that I've expressed produced a document where they made the statement that at PM 2.5 there is no safe limit, no safe threshold, however you determine the semantics, if you are producing particulates there is no size that's safe, is the assertion anyway, by DEFRA. And what has happened since I retired because of my eyesight deterioration is that I'm learning more and more uh, about what is harmful and what I'm finding is that where 40 years ago we were concerned primarily with the problems in air pollution that were straightforward to understand, today it's emerging that we don't understand and I'm wanting the science to bring us up to speed so that we can convince the politicians like Eric Pickles and I'm greatly pleased that Eric has taken note and acknowledged that fact. What I'm wanting the public um, to listen to in answering your question, Mr Kingston, about this um, and Dick is that he had experience with air pollution in 1994. He was able to demonstrate that the locus of asthma was downwind of smokestacks. And the, one of the problems is that when I talk about academia, it can take years for anything to happen. But the evidence is mounting that rather as Claire Holman, Dr. Holman alluded to, as we learn more, we will regulate more on the basis of fact. And it's knowing how to, to alert the politicians, um, the agencies, and the public so that we don't create panic. I'm not ranting, but I'm an academic at the moment, involved in projects into dementia and other orphan diseases. We are looking at spending quite a lot of money doing a three-year PhD with a student we've yet to basically um, get into the university. I'm going to be a consulting the aerosol nano analyst and we're hoping the work will be done at Manchester but the cohort study will be done in Edinburgh between Professor Raymond Agius who I'm actually advising and Professor Ken Donaldson using my atom analysis techniques non-destructively. Um, if you've got the time, I could go into more, but I think at that point I would ask you to ask me another question so that it don't sound as if I'm having a rant. <laughs> well, we don't have the benefit of the research yet. It's not as obviously not available as you know, it's to be carried out. Do you have another question? No, the, the, the only point of my question, uh, Mr. Cliff, was that Dr. Van Stienis has what we might describe as a particular view on these things. Which uh, emerges from what I've just read out. 
which is why I'm very pleased that BCAG haven't employed it. Good. Well, um, the, the, the next matter, I, I don't want to or need to ask you about, but just to check that when you said in paragraph 2.4 of your paper... Okay, let me get that. 2.4... The nice thing about being brief is I don't have to wade through lots of text. 2.4, incineration is being banned in Belgium, etc. And then I go on to plasma R. Are you going to ask a right. question about I? Well, uh, both of those, in fact. First of all, um, to ask you whether or not you've seen a, um, a short statement by Mr. Oden which is called his rebuttal proof of evidence. Have, have you been able to see that? Yes, and um, my, my first comment would be Mr. Rothen would say that, wouldn't he? Well, um, I, I, I can appreciate you might say that, but let, let me just complete the, uh, well, the introductory uh, of it. Yep. Uh, Mr. Rothen has addressed your view that plasma arc incineration is now internationally recognized will have been able to read that and I don't need to trouble you with it but incineration is being banned in Belgium uh, for the reason explained by Mr. Oden yeah. it's not quite correct is it? Um, the, the okay. position, let, me, let me just point it out to you so that you know exactly where to look and don't have to trawl through, um, through it all if you look at, in the, the document of paragraph 515 that sums it up in this this way. In other words, Belgium. Belgium yeah, has implemented. In other words, Belgium has implemented a selective ban on incineration because the country already has enough capacity. Other European countries also have large numbers of incineration plants. For example, according to CEWEP, the Confederation of European Waste to Energy Plants, there were 129 incineration plants in France and 72 in Germany in 2010. Under these circumstances, it is not surprising that fewer new plants are being built. I can't disagree with that. Thank you. Uh, and then, um, on the precautionary approach, I don't know whether you were here in the inquiry, Mr. Cliff, when I drew the inspector's attention to what had been said about the precautionary approach in another appeal case, uh, the case in Cornwall, and the, the principles involved in applying it. Were you present then? Um, I think I heard your assertion, but I won't repeat the thoughts going through my mind. No, um, the the, the reason kind. is, I need to add a caveat to, to, to um, you having asked me this question about the precautionary approach. Um, I'm an advisor for the European Environment Agency, and under the precautionary principle, which is the document that's the most read in Europe with respect to precaution, I have reviewed the documents on nanotechnology, and that is where I took a line that's in my statement from. The problem is that nanotechnology, the review I've reviewed, um, should have been published in April on my 62nd birthday. It's still not been published and I'm trying to find out why because the assertions in that about the risks with nanotechnology are really quite frightening. Um, here in Manchester we have at the University the Department of Physics and Andre Geim and his colleague um, won the Nobel Prize two years ago and he and Constantine were awarded in the Queen's Awards uh, knighthoods. So I, it, it's another Sir, Professor Sir that I know. The, the thing that's important 
is that there are concerns being raised, not just about biomass incineration, but the nanotechnology industry, which is investing billions to produce products that might be harmful, and we're being sold these products on the strength of the value of them, not the risk. And I, I asked a lady on Monday if she knew that it, her, her silver uh, bracelet was converted into nanoparticles, it would kill bacteria. She said, I didn't know that. It's not the sort of everyday chat that the dog is <laughs> done. <laughs> Can you comment on, on uh, the precautionary principles in relation to the proposal that work? What are your thoughts on that, I can, I can give you thoughts on the, pr the principle. For the principle. Um, essentially, you assess the risks, and rather than ignore risk, you try to do a quantitative rather than a qualitative assessment. And one of the ways of doing that quantitative assessment is to get as much data as you can and let me just give an example so that I, I can point out to you how precaution is moving generally in the right direction. We have the great smog of, I think it was 1953, Gerald Morrow brought in the Clean Air Act in 56. Um, we, we have clean, smokeless regions uh, we have trouble with the burning of coal causing smogs. I'm old enough to remember them. The precautionary approach basically has got rid of smogs to a great extent, but part of the reason is that the last 30, 40 years we've been burning methane from the North Sea. We're running out. We're going to burn waste to save the landfill tax. The, the, the whole situation with air pollution was that it stopped at 10 microns and I'm told, though don't, I can't give you a, a, a statement of proof with respect to this, that it was applied at 10 microns as a size limit because that was about the size limit for asbestos and I know that's for a fact but I'm not going to go into that. And it was applied as a mass limit at that size for asbestos. All smaller particles were totally ignored because the consensus of opinion by experts at Turner Brothers was it's so small it can't have an impact on health. The thing that we have now is that as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, whatever it is, even if it's silver, its surface area increases, and if any of you understand chemistry, you make the catalysts smaller to make them more e efficient, because catalysts operate by not being consumed in a reaction, but by catalyzing and speeding up the reaction. And that reactivity increases as something gets smaller and its surface area increases. A PM10 particle, if it becomes a nanoparticle, will have a billion times more surface area than a PM10 particle. If you do the maths, it's of that order. And one of the great fears being expressed where people know this is that we need to regulate better. Now, NIOSH submitted a letter to a colleague of mine, Professor Charles Lyman, last year, where nanotechnology, if it's developed in America and the legislation is put in place, will require the laboratory where that research is done to ensure that nothing can escape from it and you'll go into the laboratory through an airlock 
the inside will be kept at less than one atmospheric pressure so that only the pollution from the outside gets in, the very reverse of a clean room. But the important point is, I, I want the inquiry and you, Mr. Richards and, and Mr. Pickles, to realise we're in a transition phase now and if the plant is being built to regulation limits that apply now, if subsequently tighter limits are imposed, um, and on the BAT best available technology, um, you, you, you are actually facing increased costs. Now, that, as discussed, is actually that meek. Um, I would remind people who heard it earlier this week, best available technology not entailing excessive cost. In the jargon of people with a greater sense of humour than I have, they say that it actually is not that, it's catnap. Cheapest available technology narrowly avoiding prosecution. Okay. Um, have you seen what Mr. Uh, Mr. Oson has to say about uh, PM, PM 2.5 and PM 1? Refer me to the particular statement. Well, I, I just scan the to document. Mr. Kingston. I have read the. Uh, I have read okay. The yes, I, I was. Uh, so, with, with regard to the nanoparticles, yeah. can I just complete. Yeah. Uh, we started there with a question about the precautionary yeah. principle. Yeah. If I could remind you that the, the principles I said were appropriately applied by Mr. Robertson, agreed by the Secretary of State in Cornwall, were taken from paragraph 2103 of his report, which is contained in Mr. Singleton's Appendix 5. With regard um, to we nano... We have a copy of that document. Well, it's, it's in the core document. It's, sorry, it's Mr. Singleton's appendix five. Mr. Uh, Singleton's. Uh, re refresh. Paragraph two one zero three. Refresh so, of what it says again, please. Yes, certainly. If you'd like to read it out, I'm very happy to do so. Thank you very much. You, you can probably read better than I can. I should guarantee you that. Appendix 5, it's, it's the Cornwall, um, paragraph 2103, page 357. It's, a, it's behind the coloured tab, I think, as well. That is, yes, that is it. You, you can always recognise this because Mr. Robinson's report was compendious. Right. 2103. Right, by the Court of Appeal yeah. as being oh, yeah. my thorough record for, for any inspector's report. 2103. Well, it survived the Court of Appeal as the as something to be said for it. So, page 357, paragraph 2103. <laughs> your help is much appreciated. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, my eyesight isn't better, but um, I can no longer drive or apply gliders, so I'm not very happy about it. Let me, three, read, let me read the paragraph out for you. 2103. Third parties and some local residents suggested that the precautionary principle should be invoked. PPS 23 makes it clear that the precautionary principle should apply only when there is good reason to believe that harmful effects may occur to health or to the environment, and that there is a level of scientific uncertainty about the risk which would prevent a competent assessment to inform decision-making. These considerations do not apply in this case. In the first place, PPS 10 and WSS, the Waste Strategy 2007, provide clear, unequivocal statements as to the absence of evidence of harm to health from incineration. The consultation responses from the PCT on the permit also provide a clear statement as to there being no good reason to suggest that the CERT facility would adversely affect human health. Second, the permit issued by the EA Environment Agency provides a firm, well-founded framework for assessing risk and for putting into place the control
controls to minimize harm. And that was the approach that Mr. Clearfire invited the inspector to adopt in this case. I'm very glad you gave me the opportunity to read that and that you picked it out for me to read. Um, let, let me find a document. Hmm. No. Okay, um, given what I read there, um, responses from the PCT, is that patient care trust? Primary care trust. Primary care trust. Okay. Um, I accompanied members of BCAG to a meeting with Mr. Abdul Razik, the Trafford PCT head, in I think it was January or February last year. Um, there were two members of the Health Protection Agency, Mark Brown and George Kosiewski. Um, that's my best pronunciation of a name I can't pronounce properly. But um, I asked him if he was Polish. He said his roots went back to Eastern Europe and he's got family in different areas. So I apologise for not being able to pronounce his surname but I was subsequently asked, given what I stated, to review the HPA 2010 biomass incinerator review. I did. And to, to draw your attention, Mr. Uh, Richards, to the Health Protection Agency document confirming a new incinerator study, I have a copy of it in front of me now, dated 24th of January 2012, and I would invite anyone to get a copy. Melanie Cody copied the document for me. They're on the uh, table where you sign in. Um, let me, if you've got time and patience... Well, it's, it's not something that Mr. Kingston would have seen, so... Um, would, would you like to have a read of it? Uh, as it happens, I've read it more than once. Uh, Good, uh, excellent. Uh, well, uh, 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 I've already, sir, uh, I have already referred to the document and to the fact that the study is underway and drawn your attention to the paragraph in the Battlefield Enterprise Park Decision Letter yes. where uh, the inspector said what his view was about the relevance of the study. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I'm very happy with this. I, I read the that? statement, but um, I don't endorse its opinion. That's that, that simple. Um, we, we, did, we did cover that with Mr. I, I think we've covered it well enough. What, what but, uh, thank you for letting me read it. I, I could only all. hear the discussion. Not at all. Thank you. Uh, the, the, um, the final thing that uh, we just need to touch on with you, with Mr. Cliff, is with regard to nanoparticles. Uh -huh. Uh, and what I want to do first of all is to give Mr. Richards, for the benefit of his note, um, some references from the Environment Agency's decision document, core, de core document 67B, and then I'm just going to take one of them uh, with you so that um, you have the opportunity of commenting on it. Will I find this in this room? Binder? No, someone will provide it for you, however. Uh, I've got a copy here, and I've since relocated my own copy. So <laughs> you can have this copy. It goes back to the. Uh, <coughs> goes back to Trafford, I think. Permit with introductory notes, CD. It's the, thick, the thicker document, I think. 676. That, that's correct. 67B. 67B is the thicker document. B. Okay. So, so may I give you the, the references? Uh, I'm not proposing to go through yeah, that's fine. Right. But yeah. if I give you the references, first of all, please. Paragraph 5.3.3, page 50. Page 154. Right, okay. I've now found page, the page numbers. Hang on a minute, please, Mr. Clifford, if you listen to these, there are page 154, page 164, 
and page 172. Okay, well, give me the first page number again. The, the one I'd like you to go to, um, this, uh, is uh, page 164. Well, this document 67B only goes... Oh, no, I've read it wrong then. Right. Bear with me. I think it might be in two parts. It might be a further document with it, which is the appendices. Right. That's why I wasn't finding it. You're correct. And... One... Well, it's page 164, but right. I, I think there was a permit, there was the main okay. document, and then there was the appendix. That's 164. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry to miss you. Um, okay, reference was made to the following statements, top left. Yes, and what um, I'm looking at is particularly the agency's response in the right-hand column which starts with the word both past and current research. Yeah. You see that? This is the agency answering questions that have been raised, which, as you can see, yeah. uh, relate to PM 2.5s and other particles. <coughs> both past and current research suggest that fabric filters are highly efficient at removing all sizes of particulate matter, including nanoparticles from the exhaust gases emitted from incinerators. Published data from research work spanning over 30 years suggests that the collection efficiency for all sizes of particles is not less than 99% and can be higher than 99.995%, even for nanoparticles. Notwithstanding this, the impact for PM10 and PM2.5 has actually been screened out as being insignificant under worst case operating conditions. We are therefore satisfied that the health of the public will not be put at risk by such emissions. See section 5.2.4 and 5.3.3 of this document. The filters will have multiple compartments with bag first detection to minimize the release in the event of a bag rupture and the site EMS will include the necessary maintenance requirements. Now, that's as it were a um, a summary of EMS's environmental management system. Thank you. Um, that's a, a summary. The other references I've given, uh, particularly the first one, is a bigger explanation of the agency's overall position. But, but clearly the agency have looked at it, haven't they, Mr. Cliff, based on their experience and their looking at the research and reached a view that we need not be concerned about nanoparticles as long as appropriate measures are in place of the kind they've referred to. How do you want me to answer that? Yes or no? No, I'd, I'd like you to answer it in any way that's convenient to you, Mr. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you I'm very much. Like to um, a, a, a let let me put it this not. way. Let me put it this way. If a student of mine had been writing that, I wouldn't have endorsed it. Now, this is where I come back to the Health Protection Agency and their database review. The 2010 review on biomass had excellent assertions in the text. The conclusion didn't reflect on the assertions of the text. So I got in touch with Bob Maynard, who was the principal author of the document and I basically challenged Bob um, I, I know a few people like Bob and he fortunately is now retired and because of the questioning of the conclusion the HPA have started a two year study to get uh, an improved database and what I've asserted is that the conclusion should have included we hope that our imperatives are right 
and they make the statement that a modern, well-managed biomass incinerator will have a negligible effect. I don't agree with them, but I believe they're just hoping that that's true. And to try and prove the point, they are spending two years reviewing their database. During that two years, groups that I'm involved with will be taking brain samples and looking for titanium dioxide particles because they, in the modern environment, are anthropogenic. Anthropogenic means man-made. They are the replacement pigment in paint replacing lead oxide. The thing will be, if we find titanium dioxide um, as a mineral its yeah, name is we, we will we, we, well we don't have we, any, I, we I, don't I, have any research right I'm, I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying thinking through the fact that we haven't got any research which is why I emphasize the caution of the precautionary principle the, the important thing for me is that someone said that if we applied it we wouldn't be flying and we wouldn't have gone to the moon. The people who started flying Orville and Wilbur Wright knew the risk and took the risk knowing the risk. People fly today knowing that the airplane could crash. The assertion of risk has to be understood with an understanding of the science. Dr. Tim Norrott in Nature pointed out that a low-risk scenario that ex exposing itself to the public persistently becomes a high risk by virtue of the persistence of exposure. So as I read this and I see, um, let, me, let me quote, the collection efficiency for all size of particles is not less than 99% and can be higher than 99.995 even for nanoparticles. And I'm afraid even for nanoparticles is just wrong. It might be here in a document and it might be an extant statement of justification, but I'm afraid it's wrong. Some people believe the earth is flat. I don't. <laughs> no, I, I, nothing else, but I, I uh, said that I, I failed to give you the, um, the paragraph references from the decision about the decisions where the HVA's review had been dealt with. Um, and um, the first is Mr. They're both Mr. Singleton's appendices. The first, Appendix 6. Okay, do I have to uh, copy no, that? No, you don't need it. It's, it's, it's all right, it's something I've referred to already. Paragraph, paragraph 93 of that decision letter and uh, <coughs> Appendix 7, which is the Sinfid Lane decision, uh, paragraph 111 at page 21, <coughs> where Mr. Robinson addressed the same point uh, that the HBA review meant they didn't believe their advice or didn't think it was uh, appropriate advice. Thank you very much, Mr. Cliff, for your help. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cliff. Do you have any read that I don't, sir. Okay. okay, well, I don't have any further questions. That's what uh, do you do you what have you been seeking? You mean it's all over now? It's all over now. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Cliff. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now I don't know whether um, Mr. Manchin is here uh, and whether he's, no, he's, he's not here. He's not here. Okay. So he's going to speak tomorrow. He's going to speak tomorrow. Okay, that's an excellent motion. It makes a very good program today, so thank you for everybody for that. Um, we'll adjourn until 9 or 10 tomorrow. We're going to hear Mr. Manchin and Dr. Ra tomorrow. It occurs to me we might have time because we have third class speakers beginning the back. Uh, one to thirty. Yeah. Um, again, I was just trying to estimate um, when would be the best time to ask people to come in. We might have some time, so 
it might be appropriate to have a look at the conditions Yes, uh, um, certainly from our point of view, I, I don't anticipate being a very long time with uh, either Mr. Manchet or uh, Dr. Roberts, so uh, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to uh, do other things. Okay, well, I think the, the most appropriate thing would be to do, we've got to, we've got to say um, for the third party speakers that certain clarity, unless anybody's here, uh, yes. and that comes early, in which case we can do but perhaps I could say in the, the afternoon, my own firm to go to will be there in the afternoon. Okay. And he will take that session on behalf of the firm. That's fine. I should also say this, that is, I won't be here in the afternoon session if I'm speaking against You won't. Uh, well, it, it's the, a session for, for all. The people will be represented. Okay. So that's fine. I think, I think I might stick with the arrangement because I think uh, it'll just confuse you, or there's a risk that it'll just confuse people, including myself, I think. So um, we'll, we'll stick with the arrangements and, and hear what people have to say when they come up. So, so thank you very much for the answer. Okay, well, we'll adjourn till 9 tomorrow morning, and uh, thank you for your contribution today. Two minutes up in the room, and I feel physically well done, Graham. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent, <laughs> it was really good. Excellent, Hello? excellent. What did you notice? I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no. oh, it's good. Excellent. I miss that. It was actually oh. absolutely.